is looking at you, kid. Come on, let's shag ass. I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. When it comes to Lisbon, there is a certain magic in the air. Maybe it's the enchanting golden hour light dancing across terracotta roof tiles, or the notion of losing yourself in historic neighbourhoods like Alfama. It could be the finger licking satisfaction of polishing off the best share plates you have ever eaten, or the surreal experience of exploring the surrounding fairy tale towns. Lisbon brings together the best of big city energy with a cosy neighbourhood charm just waiting for you to discover. My husband Ryan and I recently spent 72 incredible hours exploring this magical city and the surrounding region, so here is a little travel vlog covering exactly what we did, ate and drank to help you one, get very excited for your trip, and two, plan your stay in Lisbon. We arrived at Lisbon's train station from Porto in the afternoon and it was incredibly easy to catch the train down from Porto and also pretty affordable at only 30 euros per person. But let's have a moment for how gorgeous this train station is please. We then checked into our hotel which was the Moxie. It was a little bit outside of the main historic centre but only about a 20 minute walk in or a 5 minute Uber. For a slightly more budget hotel room I was really impressed with the way it was designed. It just got everything right and it looked really beautiful. It had all the essential amenities you needed and we got these cute little welcome drinks. Basically five minutes after we arrived we were back out to explore again because Lisbon has been on my bucket list for so long and I just couldn't wait. We strolled our way around the streets taking in the architecture and just really getting lost and exploring around the castle and our farmer area. Lisbon is absolutely beautiful but also ridiculously steep so make sure you bring your walking shoes. I have heard some other people comment on Lisbon's graffiti or saying it felt a little dirty but for me I think this adds to the layers of history of a city and it is important to kind of take it in and understand it. We can't always expect places with such a rich history and evolution to stay immaculate and pristine and the way they look is a reflection of their change and the stories that come alongside that. We of course had to secure a pastel donata for a late afternoon snack and then we slowly made our way up to explore the area near our dinner reservation. Dinner was at this restaurant which came highly recommended by every person I asked about where to eat in Lisbon and we somehow managed to get a reservation but you do have to book weeks in advance by emailing the restaurant. And I am so glad we did because there were about 30 people outside the door before this place even opened. And I 100% get why. The food and vibes, they were impeccable. It was relaxed, fun, simple and delicious fare and I loved this octopus rice situation. It really was the star of the show and I didn't even order that so all of the kudos for that goes to Ryan for that decision. It is day two in Lisbon and you know we are kicking it off with a top-notch brunch spot. You are honestly spoiled for choice in this city, so I pulled out my Lisbon map and picked Augusto as the spot for us to try today. You will find a line here but it doesn't take long and it is well worth the wait. The toast that we got was stacked with these sort of local handmade ingredients and frankly it's ruined all other regular toast for me. As a dessert first person I could not pass up the banana bread slathered in peanut butter as well as a scoop of pastel donata flavoured ice cream. We then needed to walk this massive meal off and luckily Lisbon's hilly and windy streets were more than happy to oblige. We were on our way to the castle which was meant to be about a 15 minute walk but it actually ended up taking us an hour because I kept stopping to look at all of these incredible views including this crazy viewing platform that we stumbled upon while we were walking up. We arrived at the castle and just a quick tip here, buy your tickets online so you can enter immediately and bypass the huge queue. Sao George Castle is a 10th century castle originally built by the Moors and later expanded and modified by the Portuguese. You will find a bunch of peacocks here as well which was my favourite part. They were brought to Lisbon by Portuguese explorers and kind of just spend their days roaming around the grounds of the castle. We then headed down the hill to the centre of town and further along the coast to check out the Green Street. There were plenty of cute coffee shops and stores to pop into around this area so I highly recommend a visit as an alternative to the very popular Pink Street. Next we continued along the coast to Alex Factory which is a creative complex made up of a lot of cute stores, art galleries, vintage shops, boutiques and plenty of restaurants. The sunshine was just really doing the most this day so we pulled up a spot at this bar in Alex factory for a drink 
And is this not the most extra Aperol spritz you've ever seen? It was basically the size of my head. We then caught an Uber back into town for our dinner reservation at Taberna Sal Grosso. This was honestly one of the best meals I have had this year. Every single dish here was a 10 out of 10. Don't get me wrong, I love the occasional fancy restaurant, but this really is my favorite way to eat. Really humble and flavorful dishes, entirely confident in what they were and not trying to be anything otherwise. Oh, and sangria by the jug, of course. This really was a trip highlight for me, so if you do one thing in Lisbon, make a booking here and make it this. Hi from Jess in the future. Before we wrap up the last two days of the vlog, I wanted to quickly jump on here and give a shout out to my Lisbon and Porto pocket guides. I created these guides in Notion and basically you get a link with everything you need to have an incredible first time in these cities without actually having to do too much planning yourself. They come with a three day sample itinerary, some day trip and experience recommendations and some off the beaten path alternatives if that's what you prefer. Plus my favorite part, a Google map with more than 60 restaurant, cafe and foodie recommendations, which really helps if you are on the go and you just kind of want to pull into somewhere and eat. I put a lot of love and thought and planning into these guides and it is a great way to support me doing more of what I love which is really just creating helpful and useful travel content like this so the links will be in the description but enough of that let's get back to the Lisbon vlog. The next day we were up bright and early for a day trip to Sintra to try our best to at least beat some of the crowds. We picked up a coffee from Fabrica near the train station and also grabbed our train tickets to Sintra and this whole part of the process was super easy which made me think that hopefully we had made the right decision by self-navigating this trip. My main reason for choosing to do a DIY trip as opposed to booking a day tour was because I didn't really want to go to Pena Palace. I just personally don't enjoy places that are super crowded or have very long lines and I knew this is what Pena Palace would be like. Like, so we just wanted to try and do things a little bit differently. So our first stop in Sintra was this place. I'm not going to try and pronounce it, but I will pop it on screen. And it was only about a 15 minute walk from the train station. Again, you will want to book your tickets online for this place before coming to Sintra because the reception here wasn't that great and you don't want to wait in line for physical tickets. And I have to say this place was incredible. We explored the absolutely expansive and gorgeous gardens and I probably could have spent like just the whole day here. The one mistake we did make though was leaving the initiation well which is one of the things that this place is known for until last this had the most ridiculous line so it was a hard no from us but we took a look at the photos online accepted it for what it was and decided to opt for an ice cream in the cafe instead and this is where our day started to kind of take a turn we tried to get to our next location which was the park and palace of Montserrat it is a little bit further out of the way so we tried to get there using the public transport but at the time the roads were really congested and everything was late so after after about half an hour of waiting for a bus, we just gave up and headed back into town for lunch. We enjoyed a lovely relaxing meal at this place and we were even serenaded by some music and then we popped by this bakery to pick up some of Sintra's famous pastries before jumping on the train back to Lisbon. So I think my takeaway from Sintra is that if you want to pack more into your day, definitely opt for a day trip where things are all scheduled for you and the transport is taken care of. I've linked some options in the description. Once back in Lisbon, I had one thing left on my bucket list, which was to see an incredible sunset, and I absolutely got it. We explored two different viewpoints, taking in the evening light as it danced across the city. After picking up a pre-dinner gelato, of course, we wandered around the streets to find a place to eat for dinner, and we stumbled upon this tiny little wine bar. Here they had the most delectable bites and an excellent local wine selection, and it really just was the perfect way to finish off our last evening in this really mesmerizing city. I've been stuck in limbo, thinking about the rainbow way over there. Day 4 was our last day in Lisbon and we had a couple of hours to kill before jumping back on the plane to London. The morning started at the Folks, which was definitely my type of brunch place. I ordered an incredibly indulgent tiramisu latte and these gorgeous fresh fluffy ricotta pancakes. We then set off on a little shopping expedition, starting at the ceramic store where there were so many beautiful pieces to choose from. This was the point where I was kicking myself for not having enough space left in my bags, but I managed to score these stunning little coasters and an olive dish. We also stumbled upon a little market, so we browsed the spot 
before heading to Otrevo and picking up the famed Bifina. This is a pork sandwich that was profiled by Anthony Bourdain when he visited Lisbon for no reservations. I then had what can only be described as a pastage donata panic, so we stopped by not one but two different places for our final taste of my favourite dessert. Like I know we have these in London but they just do not taste the same. We then made our way across town to probably one of the best value activities we did the whole time in Portugal. It was the National Tile Museum and when I say this is one of the most beautiful galleries I've been to, I'm not exaggerating. It is also an incredibly unique place to go because obviously when you are in Lisbon you want to learn more about the history of the tiles and they also have a gorgeous cafe that you can relax and unwind in afterwards and a couple of random resident turtles. And just like that, our time in Lisbon was up and I sadly had to face a late night and further delayed trek back to Luton because flights these days are extortionate and I would rather spend that money on food. If you want more travel inspiration, make sure you check out my 72 hours in Porto vlog, which is a destination that you should absolutely have on your wish list if you are heading to Portugal. And I will see you all in the next one.